All right, um, we're gonna quick have a quick review so we can uh, continue on with this same message about the resurrection redemption power of the Lord Jesus Christ. An empty tomb declares God is just and justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. An empty tomb speaks volumes, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the only person who's ever lived who suffered the death of crucifixion and, and a death that was obviously a physical uh, destruction of his physical body and probably wouldn't have had much blood left in his body when he was placed in the tomb and yet he resurrected he was raised on the third day they found an empty tomb and he ascended to be with the father so the Lord Jesus Christ of all belief systems is the all based on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ his death burial resurrection and ascension in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, verses 54 through 56, we reviewed, well, we read this last week and went over it. We're just going to quickly review these passages before we get into the message. But in, in that passage, it says, uh, O death, where is thy sting? Um, and this, it, that passage says, The sting of death is sin, and the victory of, of the sting of death is still to put our body in a grave. And so death still has a stinger today, and yet that, res that passage is based on the concept that we have hope of resurrection life. And at the rapture, when we receive our resurrect resurrected bodies, then we'll be able to say, O oh death, where is thy sting? Today it still has a sting. Uh, and why, does, why is it that we die? Why is it that we have sickness and, and terrible disease? Why is it that these things are the plague of all humanity all over the planet? And the reason is that the cause of all sickness and death is sin. The curse of sin that came and was placed upon all creation when Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 when God said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And that's spirit, soul, and body. A death of all three parts of our nature. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, uh, the verse says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Uh, in Revelation 21, 8, the passage ends, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So not only is it that body, all, all of us die, death continues uh, until the rapture, uh, that is for the, the hope of believers in the, as members of the church, the body of Christ, who have trusted that Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. The hope of all believers is a resurrection body. But until then, that uh, all creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That still is a process in which death will take our body and put it in the grave. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the passage says that for he, that is God the Father, hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and God, uh, he, he drank of the cup of the wrath of Almighty God against the, uh, to take upon himself uh, the curse of sin uh, that is upon the whole world. He endured it on the cross for a purpose that he might be a redeemer and a savior to all those that believe. Uh, in Romans chapter 6, 23, the, the passage says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So death is the wages of sin. Sins have been paid for, yet we still die and go to a grave, even though the sins that bring that curse and death uh, have been paid for. And so that's a, a strong argument that the sins of all humanity were not forgiven at the cross, but the means whereby God can offer redemption to all those who believe uh, was accomplished 
at the cross. And so an empty tomb means all of our sins are paid in full. That's something those of us who, who trust the Word of God and the promise of God of eternal life to all who uh, by faith trust that Christ died for their sins, we have hope because there was an empty tomb on resurrection morning. In Acts chapter 5 verse 31, uh, the passage says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus Christ, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up, him God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So when uh, Peter talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and preach to his audience and acts chapter 5, he said that God raised him up with the power of his right hand and exalted him to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. So the, the issue with the resurrection being uh, is redemption power is that the sins that bring uh, um, the, the curse of sin that brings um, sickness and death has been broken and the forgiveness of sins now is God is just and justifier of all that he promised the forgiveness of sins and this is a, uh, a study that, that we've been continuing uh, in our studies we're we're going to go back to our regular studies uh, next week and we're in Romans chapter 3 verse 25 uh, the passage talking about uh, the uh, uh, that we're justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just in the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus so the empty tomb is proof that God is just to have promised given Abraham the promise of eternal life and to all those who have the faith of Abraham uh, that they would re uh, God made a covenant with Abraham uh, that the Abraham and his seed would receive the promised land as an everlasting possession. Eternal life means that God has made you righteous. Eternal life is only possible to a person who is perfectly righteous. Sin brings death. So sin had to be taken away in order for God to make someone an heir of eternal life. Um, sin has to be removed and righteousness has to be imputed to every soul to, to receive eternal life. And so in time past, God promised eternal life in the land as an everlasting possession to Abraham and his seed. And God was looking forward to uh, the cross in time past. And Rome, we saw last time in Romans chapter 1, uh, in verses 1 through 4 that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is, was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. He has power, redemption power, in order to offer eternal life to, to all those that believe. Uh, verse 16 of uh, chapter 1 of Romans, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And the power of God is in the gospel, faith that Christ died to pay for your sins today. Uh, salvation is by sanctification of the spirit, the gospel, and uh, belief of the truth. That's the part of the believer. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, we saw that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Uh, and we uh, finished up last week in Matthew chapter 12, 24, and I'm just going to review uh, real quick uh, the passages that Jesus was answering the question of the Sadducees who were trying to question the resurrection. Uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ's answer to them, of course, was a scriptural appeal. And he said, you do, uh, do ye not therefore err because you know not the scriptures? He says, neither the power of God. 
talking about the resurrection, the power of God, uh, is redemption power. And so the Lord Jesus Christ says to them, he says, as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how that in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? And he said, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Now, the dead, when they die, they're not living anymore. They're suffering the second death. What we read in, uh, I just quoted in, in Revelation 21, uh, the passage says, uh, they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Now, torment, the torment side of, the hell, of hell, is in a compartment that will be cast into the lake of fire uh, when the Lord comes back and he judges the world. Uh, and at the there's a millennial a thousand year reign of Christ and then death and hell are going to be cast into the lake of fire and that's where, the, where there will be continue to be all the souls that are in hell will be cast into the lake of fire in a torment that will last forever and that's referred to as the second death that second death begins in the torments of hell upon death of each individual until death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. So when the Lord made reference to Abraham, when he answers the Sadducees question, they were doubting uh, Sadducees don't believe in a bodily resurrection. When the Lord answered them, he, he made reference to the, uh, to God speaking to Moses out of the bush saying that he is, I am the God of Abraham. Abraham is alive. And so the question is, where was Abraham? when God spoke to Moses in the, out of the bush? And the answer is Abraham was in Abraham's bosom. How do we know that? We know that from Luke chapter 16. Uh, we know that from uh, the passage in Samuel that makes reference to uh, uh, Saul having the witch of Endor conjure up Samuel. And we know that God allowed that. That's not something that uh, any person with divination is normally has the power to do, but God uh, rose up Samuel so that Saul could hear the answer to the question that he had about would he die in the battle the next day against the Philistines. And so, so the souls of saints, believers who died in time past, the way we know that their sins were forgiven in time past is that they are not in torments. Instead, they were in Abraham's bosom. We're going to go now to Luke 16, um, Luke chapter 16, and we're going to look at verse 19. Some, I'm amazed that some people will read this and claim, well, that's just a parable and not give it any uh, credence or any any value as far as scripture. And yet, even in parables, when the Lord did speak in parables, it was always a truth that was figurative, but it was a truth. And the truth would be enough uh, to prove without a doubt where the, the souls of saints in time past were in time past before the cross, and would also establish as truth where the souls of the lost go when they die. But this particular parable, there's a name for Lazarus, and parables don't ever give names for persons. Uh, they just refer to it as a man, a certain person, this or that, and, and vague reference. But this names Lazarus, so we know it's not a parable. There was a certain rich man, verse 19, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, the rich man, and in hell lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So here, Lazarus is on one side of hell, 
and the rich man is in torment on the other side of hell. Verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, <clears throat> have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham, and his, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now, the reason the rich man was in hell wasn't because he was a rich man. He was in hell because he died in unbelief. Lazarus, a believer when he died. Verse 26, And beside all this, between you, us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they, can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren. And, and Abraham said unto him, uh, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. So this passage establishes where saints in time past were until after the cross. I want to just take a, a couple quick minutes. Um, go to Luke 23 now. Luke 23. What about the thief on the cross that died uh, and faith? Uh, he, he, on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ is a demonstration of who he is, even in death. And, of course, the thief on the cross recognized this was not just an ordinary man. And he trusted in him. And in, in, in 23, verse 43, um, well, let's, let's read verse 41. And we, okay, verse 40. There, there were two malefactors, verse 39, which were hanged, and they railed on the Lord, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, the, that's what one of the malefactors said, the other one answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condition? And we indeed justly, for we receive the reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, notice, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So the one uh, malefactor, when, when he dies, if he dies and, and he's in unbelief, obviously, he is going to go into torments. The one that believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, which is the kingdom gospel, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, he believed that Jesus is the Messiah when he hung there with him on the cross. And the Lord saw his faith and said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. So saints in time past, when they died, they went to paradise. We have, we have clear evidence that saints did not go into torment in time past. Now, some people want to get around this argument that do not believe that saints in time past have the forgiveness of sins uh, or other reasons they don't want to believe in resurrection or so forth. But they do so by, th by saying that when a soul dies, their body, spirit, and soul are in the grave until some future time when God raises and, um, and sorts out the, the saved from the unsaved. But that's not what the scriptures say. There's a, there's a second death, a spirit and a soulish death. Uh, and that happens upon death. The spirit and soul leave the body. And then we know from these passages, they're in paradise until after the cross. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 8 through 10, we have another uh, understanding about the saints in paradise. Uh, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10 says, after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into, notice, the lower parts of the earth? Uh, it's not Abraham's bosom there, but that's where the Lord Jesus Christ went. He went to the lowest, uh, lower parts of the earth. That's the same uh, compartment that's described and, and that we just read about in Luke. And it says in verse 10, uh, And he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So the Lord Jesus Christ takes 
the saints of the believers from Abraham's bosom after the cross and, and the sins are paid for, uh, God declares he's just and the justifier of, of the ones that believed in time past uh, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Uh, I mentioned last time God gave IOUs as forgiveness in time past, knowing that the cross was going to happen. God who calleth those things which be not as though they were, was able in time past. He knew the cross was going to happen. It wasn't a question. It was a matter of in timing. It hadn't happened yet in time past. Uh, but the Lord takes captivity, leads captivity captive. He releases those from the, from the power of death to keep them uh, in paradise uh, by the display of God's plan and purpose unfolding to display his, the redemption power of the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection. Go, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm just going to make reference. You're familiar with 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, I knew a man, uh, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. I knew such an one was caught up to paradise. Uh, I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. Such an one was caught up to the third heaven, right? So paradise, Paul ex describes there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, is in the third heaven. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, when you see paradise in, that, in the book of Reve Revelation, uh, it's in the midst of the paradise, the tree of life, that is, is in the midst of the paradise of God, which is in New Jerusalem, uh, which is in the street of New Jerusalem. It's a garden there. And uh, paradise in time past was in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, God, the tree of life that is in time past was in uh, the Garden of Eden. And after the fall of man, God put angels around it to guard it, lest anybody who with a fallen uh, sin nature would eat of that tree and live forever and not be able to be redeemed. Uh, but uh, Revelation 21 uh, verses uh, 1 and 2, it, uh, the tree of life again is in paradise, which is in New Jerusalem. So before the cross, the fact that saints did not go into the torment side of hell is proof they had the forgiveness of sins in time past. And a lot of people are confused over the issue. There's, there's the individual forgiveness for individual believers like uh, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. There were individuals, David in Psalm 51 understood he had the forgiveness of sins. Job knew that in his body of, uh, in a body of flesh, I shall see God and resurrection life. So there's individual, individual forgiveness of sins in time past, but passages like Acts chapter three, verse 19, and uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 27, for example, uh, talk about a future forgiveness of Israel's sins, and that's talking about the nation receiving forgiveness of sins. And in our regular studies that we're going through the book of Romans, we're going to go back to those studies next week. Uh, in verse 25 uh, that we read this morning, that God set the Lord Jesus Christ forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood for the uh, remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, we have a verse that clearly says individuals had remission of sins when they lived and in their lifetime made the choice to trust God uh, for his mercy and grace to give them eternal life and remission of sins. Uh, God gave them, they believed God, God counted it to them for righteousness in time past, and Christ died for the sins of the dispensation of grace for all men and that trust that Christ died for their sins today. And so Paul makes clear that not all, that uh, justification by faith isn't just for Israel, it's for us also in Romans chapter 3 and 4 and Galatians chapter 3 and 4. Uh, but but the proof of individual forgiveness of sins is where the saints from time past went when they died. It was not torments. It was Abraham's bosom. And if you go with me to Luke 5 now, we're going to look at verse 17. Luke 5, 17. It's interesting to look at forgiveness in time past. I, I don't have the um, Luke 5... There aren't that many verses that in time past spoke about forgive and forgiveness, but I can tell you that the word forgive and the word forgiveness 
uh, only appear three times in Paul's epistles. The rest of the volume of scriptures deal with the, the doctrine of forgiving and forgiveness, individual and national, and that's what we're covering on our other studies. But in Luke chapter 5, um, in verse 17, the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, it came to pass on a certain day that as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of, of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way that they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. <laughs> and when the Lord saw their faith, he said unto the man, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Now, I want, I'm going to go on with the passage, but I want you to remember he says, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? That should be a light bulb moment for them. That this must be God. He's forgiving sins here. Uh, verse 22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereupon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. When the Lord heals someone in time past, he's forgiving their sins. And he takes the, the because the, the sickness of the sin to put them in that condition, that curse that's upon all humanity, the curse of sin that brings sickness and death randomly upon all humanity and, and different manifestations of sickness and, and causes of death. But that comes randomly on all humanity because of the curse of sin. For him to heal that man of his palsy, he, that man has faith. Who else would have taken apart, had those people carry him to the presence of the Lord, have them go, take him up on the rooftop, lower him down through the roof, just so he, he would be healed by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. He believed him to be the Messiah. He believed him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. God forgives his sins and heals him of the palsy. He's not going to take the curse of sin and the effects of the curse from an unbeliever. Because there's, it takes the redemptive power of God to heal from the curse of sin and to reverse death and to bring about resurrection are all the process of the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection power belongs to God. It's the redemptive power of God that would be brought about by the cross. Now, Luke, go with me now to Luke 9. Now, there are plenty of passages that you can look at this, and it's a simple study of forgiving sins. Forgiven, forgive, you can look up the passages. Uh, but in Luke 9, verse 37, And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly, departing, or departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, and how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered every one at the things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, Let these things sink down into your ears. 
For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. And they understood not the saying, and it was hid from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. The Lord Jesus Christ came, Christ came into the world to save sinners. On the way to the cross, he showed his power and credentials to forgive sins that would be accomplished, uh, would be justified because of the uh, God believing he would go to the cross and pay for sins of all men. He forgave the sins of uh, the saints in time past because God knew he was going to the cross and God had faith in his blood to pay for the sins of all men. So he had in his mind, I'm going to, that's why I'm here to go to the cross. But to show you who I am, I'm going to forgive sins on the way. So you know that when I die to pay for your sins, that I am God dying to pay for your sins. Go to uh, Mark chapter 4. Mark 4 verse 12. <clears throat> that seeing they may see. Okay, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ preaching in parables. I want you to get the the reference here to what believing accomplished for a saint before the cross in time past. That seeing ye may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear, they may see. I'm sorry, he's talking to his disciples, he's making reference to those who were only following him to get a free meal, and they weren't desiring to learn more about their Messiah, they didn't believe him to be the Messiah, and they just, in, in essence, he's throwing pearls uh, before the swine with many of the people that followed him, Sadducees, Pharisees, etc. That seeing they may not see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, that always means salvation, and their sins should be forgiven them. You remember the, uh, Saul was converted on the road to Damascus. Uh, so conversion is the forgiveness of sins of, that, of any individual who believes God and God counts it unto them for righteousness. So we see, the, we, we understand about sins in time past by looking at these passages. Um, what does the curse of sin bring, I mean to ask? It brings all sickness, it brings death. Who has the power to forgive sins? God. God only has the power to forgive sins. Who has the power to cancel an effect of a sin or a curse uh, that's brought upon creation? And the Lord demonstrates that He, as God, has that power, and it's the redemptive power of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many unbelievers were healed in time past? And I submit to you, none. There were zero that God healed of any kind of infirmity in time past except believers. Now, children of believing parents, children are, are uh, not at the age of accountability. They're not considered lost uh, in their sins until they reach their accountability. Uh, but their children healed. They either manifested faith in God before uh, they became sick and died uh, or else God you know, who, know, who again, knows all things, saw faith in them, but I don't think any unbeliever was healed in time past. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 uh, says about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just some references to His power. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Hebrews 1 3. Uh, God, verse 1, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and in the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, and we'll close with this passage, Revelation 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hope to see you next week.